Hi folks, my name is Chrissy Casterman. On behalf of Food and Water Watch and Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this evening, The Case for a Factory Farm Moratorium in Iowa. Thank you for joining us. I am Food and Water Watch's National Factory Farm Campaigner. I work in multiple states to take Food and Water Watch's national fight against factory farms to the next level and to fight for a more sustainable, safe, and equitable food system. I'm joined tonight by Emma Schmidt, also with Food and Water Watch, and Jess Mazur from Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. So just a couple housekeeping logistics. If you're joining us on the Zoom webinar or on the phone, you'll be muted while our panelists are speaking. If you're on Zoom and you have a question, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and enter your question. We'll be answering those at the end. I hope we'll be able to get to all of them. If not, we will be sure to follow up with you via email after the webinar concludes. So we're here tonight for the same reason that you're here tonight. And that is because we all know that Iowa has a factory farm problem. There are already somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 factory farms in Iowa. DNR isn't totally sure. And we add between 300 and 600 new factory farms every single year. So one thing we're not gonna do tonight is overwhelm you with statistics, but I would like to, to point this out. The millions of factory farmed animals in Iowa produce enough manure to fill Iowa's tallest building, the principal building in Des Moines, almost two and a half times every single day. That's a lot of manure. And this extreme volume of manure is not used to beneficially raise crops. Instead, it's over applied to fields and then it runs off and it contaminates our streams and our rivers. Iowa has nearly 800 impaired waterways. It has over 200 community drinking water systems that struggle to treat for contamination resulting from factory farm pollution. And in addition to all of those environmental and community impacts, factory farms also pose a really serious threat to our democracy because too many of our elected officials are beholden to corporate ag instead of to us, their constituents. So we're here tonight to discuss those issues and also our solution. And that is a moratorium on new and expanded factory farms in Iowa. Just briefly review the agenda. We're gonna start off with some discussion of our efforts to date to reign in this industry. We're gonna talk about why moratorium is the solution that we need right now. We're gonna talk about last week's election and what it means moving forward. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can get involved. And at the end, we'll take a few of your questions. Our first panelist tonight is Jess Mazur. Jess will be talking about what we've already done to address Iowa's factory farm crisis. Jess is the lead farm and environment organizer at Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. She works with statewide member leaders to develop and implement strategies to stop factory farms from building, to make sure current regulations are being enforced, and to pass stronger protections from the factory farm industry at the Capitol. And I will turn it over to Jess now. Hi, uh, thank you everybody um, for joining this webinar. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, as we move forward um, in fighting for a moratorium, that we reflect on where we've been and what we have done so far. Um, because we know that we're gonna hear a lot of things like, whoa, a moratorium, um, you know, that's, that's really bold. Or we might hear, uh, why don't we start lower? Let's lower the bar a little bit. But I think it's important to show that CCI members and Food and Water Watch members for many, many years, more than a decade, have been fighting factory farms. And we've tried a lot of things and that is why we're here calling for a moratorium. So I think it's important to reflect on what have we tried? What brought us to this today? So the first thing, three things I wanna talk about are ongoing things, things that we're gonna to continue to do um, as organizations um, to fight factory farms because they help us continue this work. So first of all, we fight factory farms as they expand and as they build in our communities. So when a factory farm comes in, a community gets upset, they call CCI and we work with them to figure out a strategy to stop it. You know, we have learned that the factory farm industry has found a lot of ways around the master matrix. We've learned that county supervisors, they really believe that they don't have any power. The DNR and the EPC are stacked with factory farm insiders. And because this permitting process was not built to help us, we've found that the best way to stop a factory farm is through grassroots organizing and putting pressure on the applicant to withdraw. Um, so we will continue to do this. It is how we meet new people that are impacted by the factory farm industry. It allows us to continue organizing all across the state 
um, because factory farms are coming in in every county in our state. Um, another thing that we do on a regular basis is stopping bad bills and fighting for good ones at the Capitol. Um, we have a citizen lobby team. Some of our uh, people that are in central Iowa spend a lot of time up the Capitol attending committee meetings, lobbying. And then we also do a lot of efforts at home because we know that not everyone can get to Des Moines very easily. And um, it's also really important that legislators hear about what we're doing, whether they're at the Capitol and whether they're at home. Um, so what we've learned in our efforts to stop bad bills and fight for good ones is that many legislators on both sides of the aisle, so not Democrats or Republicans, but both are bought and sold by the factory farm industry. And we know that legislators don't know a lot about this issue. Um, it's really shown us that the people who are the experts on this are the people like you who live next to a factory farm or who smell it on your drive to work or who drink polluted water or who are engaged in our campaigns. We're the experts on this. Um, <clears throat> we've also learned that legislators are unwilling to do even the smallest common sense things. Um, we attempted to pass a bill a few years ago um, to ban spreading manure on water saturated ground because we know it's already saturated, it's not gonna absorb any manure and it's likely just gonna run off into our water. And the legislature is unwilling to do even that smallest thing. And the other thing we learned, which I referenced a little bit earlier, is that we have a really big impact if we lobby at home. Um, when we lobby at home, we're exposing more people to the uh, vision and the values that matter to us. And we're making sure that those legislators feel heat in their home districts. And they know that if they want to get reelected, that they need to get with us on the issues. And then finally, what we think we all know is that if we want to have more success at the Capitol in passing good bills and not just stopping the bad ones, we have to vote in people who think like us, talk like us, and act like us. Um, because that's our best chance at passing this, not relying on someone that's not necessarily on our side. Um, so we'll continue to be your eyes and ears of the Capitol. If you're in central Iowa, we'll have lots of opportunities to go up to the Capitol. If you are at home, we'll come up with lots of ways that you can engage at home and organize in your own district. Um, but we got to keep doing that. It's very important, no matter what the makeup of the Capitol is, that we are engaging in the legislative session. Uh, so those um, two things are some of the things that are ongoing all the time. Um, we are constantly working with the legislative session, constantly fighting factory farms. And then the thing that didn't have a slide for is um, enforcement, is we were constantly making sure we're responding to manure spills um, and making sure that current laws are being enforced. The next few campaigns are things that we have done in the past, um, kind of like when our, we made the decision to fight for a moratorium. Um, in 1998, we made a decision that we wanted to address clean air and air pollution from factory farms. Um, so what we learned in that campaign was that the state and federal air laws and rules are very weak. They're not there to protect us. And we learned that factory farms do indeed have a major impact on air quality. And if you can smell it, you're probably breathing in um, particulate that could be dangerous, dangerous to your health. And we learned that the industry is going to fight us tooth and nail on even the most common sense regulations like protecting the air that we all have a right to breathe. Um, so what we did with that campaign is we strategized and we won enforceable clean air protections for factory farms. Um, but because we did not have our people in the Capitol and we were not um, as far along in engaging in elections as we are now, with the next administration, they actually gutted what we won. So it showed us that we not only have to fight for this stuff, but we have to be able to make sure it stays by winning um, seats in the legislature. So another thing um, that we have been doing for a while now is the Clean Water Act campaign. You're probably all familiar with it. We see that right now the state is implementing the Clean Water Act for the EPA of her factory farms in Iowa. And we don't think the DNR is doing a very good job. Um, I assume that you guys all agree with the amount of polluted waterways that we have that we do not have adequate protections. Um, so we told the EPA that we want the EPA to come and take over the DNR's job, and we want them to regulate factory farms in Iowa. Um, so what that did was trigger an investigation into the DNR, and they agreed with us that the DNR isn't issuing permits when necessary or doing inspections or fines and penalties. And so we entered into a five-year work plan to try to bring them into compliance. Um, that is ongoing, so there's going to be some um, updates in the next year or so with the outcomes of this campaign as we enter the end of the work plan. Um, but as you know as well as I do, um, when you look out in Iowa, not much has changed. DNR may be able to make it look good on paper, but it comes down to what's really happening in rural Iowa. 
Um, so stay tuned for that campaign um, that's ongoing and we'll hopefully have some updates later this year. Um, another thing that we did in 2015, we decided let's, we know that there's too much manure in the state. Let's try to look at the manure. Where is it being spread? How much is there? Does DNR have a handle on it? So we um, got a group of probably 20, 25 women together and we decided to map and audit all the manure management plans in five counties. We wanted to see where the manure was being applied and just kind of learn more about that process. Manure management plans are what the factory farms have to submit um, to tell us what they plan on doing with their manure. We found out that MMPs have a lot of errors, that DNR doesn't have the capacity to review them for accuracy. What's happening is that when manure management plans are submitted, the front desk person at the DNR just makes sure that they signed in the right spot and checked the right boxes, um, but they're not reviewed. We learned that factory farms don't have to follow their plans. Um, they can change it whenever they want and they just have to let DNR know that they changed something the next time they submit a plan. Um, and we also learned that what they actually do with the manure, that's private information. And um, so that's, you know, that's important to know that, you know, we can only do so much when we only know what their plan is. We have to know where they're actually putting this manure. Um, we found a lot of double dumping, found a lot of errors, a lot of problems with them. Um, but it was a really good process to go through uh, because we now are, have a lot better understanding of how manure management plans work. And it really showed what we already knew that the DNR doesn't have a handle on the 22 plus billion gallons of manure that's produced every year in our state. Um, every five years, DNR is required to take a look at their rules and see if they're still appropriate. And every five years, we weigh in on that. And this last time, uh, we actually spent a lot of time going through the rules and talking with our lawyers at Food and Water Watch and saying, what can we do in this process to make things a little bit better out in rural Iowa? Um, and so we reviewed the rules, we submitted proposed changes, we engaged the public, we submitted over a thousand public comments supporting our changes, and DNR didn't make a single one of these changes. These were things like closing the LLC loophole, so factory farmers can't build one factory farm right after another, all under different LLCs to avoid loopholes. Um, and we learned that the DNR doesn't even consider us stakeholders. Uh, the DNR gave a copy of the rule changes to the Farm Bureau and other ag groups um, way before the public, including us, got access to those documents. And so we learned that, you know, it's important to elect a good governor because that governor is who appoints the DNR director and the EPC. And that's going to make our work a lot easier if we have a friendly DNR and EPC. Um, so finally, we decided, let's try one more thing. You know, this is just really showing us that maybe we need to go big. We need to call for a moratorium. Um, so let's try one more thing. Let's, let's play their game. They want to say that we just need to tweak the master matrix. So let's try to tweak the master matrix. So we submitted our own petition for rulemaking with Food and Water Watch um, in 2017. We went around the state. We gathered input from a lot of folks just like you. We said, if we had the perfect permitting process for factory farms, what would it be? And we looked at everybody's input. We created a petition that says, um, that said, here's the things that we can do without going through the legislature. And DNR dismissed it completely. They completely dismissed our, our petition. So they're not even willing to make tiny changes to the master matrix. So we learned that 2% of these applications fail and that's not with the current administration. And we learned that there are some things that we can do without going through the legislature and DNR is not even willing to do that. So I think this is important to keep in mind as we continue our moratorium campaign that as, when you hear legislators say, whoa, slow down, let's, let's back up and try to tweak the matrix, you can say, we already did that. If they say, let's tighten up manure standards, we already tried that. That's why we're calling for a moratorium. And Chrissy is going to tell you a little bit more about that. Thanks, Jess. So as Jess has discussed, this industry has an enormous negative impact on Iowa's air and water. And we've tried a lot of different tactics to address this issue. Some of them were successful and we, we won some incremental improvements along the way, but it's clear that we need to do a lot more to protect Iowans from factory farm pollution. And aside from the pollution, there are a lot of other issues associated with this industry. So factory farms, in addition to polluting our air and water, have also caused a significant decline in the number of family farms in Iowa. It's devastated Iowa's rural communities and their economies. They're an environmental justice catastrophe 
They harm the welfare of animals. They overuse antibiotics, which contributes to the rise of antibiotic resistant superbugs. They put our food safety at risk and they also fuel climate change. So no amount of new air or water quality regulations will address all of those harms. Even if this industry's environmental impact were appropriately regulated, and it isn't, those regulations would not address the full sphere of harms caused by Iowa's factory farms. Only a moratorium will do that. And that's why the moratorium is a solution that we need right now. A moratorium on new and expanded factory farms will give us time to quantify the existing impact of Iowa's factory farms on our communities, our drinking water, our family farms, and the environment. It'll give us a chance to evaluate appropriate local control mechanisms in order to give local communities real input into the permitting process. And it will provide us with breathing room to explore solutions and alternatives to this industry. So we know, and you know, that this isn't going to be an easy lift. We had hoped for a much different outcome from last week's election, but unfortunately not a whole lot changed in Des Moines. We do have some new legislators, we have some new champions, um, but we're gonna be relying on you and your people power over the, over the coming session to make this a reality. So we'll move now to an election debrief and a quick overview of our strategy from the coming, for the coming year from Jess. Thank you again. Um, so I think everybody already knows the results of the election, but we have a trifecta in the state house, um, Republican Senate, Republican House, Republican Governor. The Senate makeup is 32-18. The House makeup is 54-46. Our governor is Kim Reynolds, and she'll be the one that gets to appoint the head of the DNR and the EPC. Um, so we know that for us that means that it's going to be a lot of um, business as usual at the state house. We probably won't see a lot of Good bills move and we're probably going to have to put our weight behind stopping some of the bad bills of the state house. But I think it's important to talk about the impact that we had on the elections because we were, we were serious about this from the beginning that we know we're not going to get a moratorium tomorrow. We're probably not going to get it this year or next year or the year after that. It's going to take us to build towards it and that's what's important for us to focus on so that we can keep building momentum because we had a huge impact on this election cycle. Um, so one big thing that shows us that we did that is that two major newspapers in Iowa asked all of the candidates in their coverage area where they stood on a moratorium. The Cedar Rapids Gazette um, asked all of their House and Senate candidates if they support a moratorium. 11 of those candidates said they support a moratorium, 11 of them. 14 candidates said they support local control or stronger permitting standards, and 13 said that they think the current system is fine. I think that shows us that we've made a big impact for candidates to be able to come out in favor of a very bold issue like a moratorium on factory farms. The Fort Dodge Messenger um, in Northwest Iowa, they are the ninth largest statewide paper and one of the largest rural papers in Iowa. They asked all of their House, Senate, and Supervisor candidates what they think about the master matrix. Um, of the State House candidates, one of the candidates supports a moratorium, five including some Republican candidates support local control or changes to the master matrix, and only two think that the current system is fine. So I think that shows us that even in some of these areas where factory, we see the most factory farms, that people are starting to realize that we've reached a tipping point. And also the Farm Bureau asked Secretary of Ag candidates um, if they think the master matrix needs to be strengthened. Um, surprise, surprise, most of those candidates said current system is fine. So we made a huge impact just by forcing candidates to take a side on this issue. We also had some of our own candidates. CCI Action, um, we had some of our members run for office across the state. Um, Nick Shute in Hardin County, Patty Naylor in Green County, Glenn Hurst in Pottawatomie County, Sue Blaisdell in Marshall County. Um, we had some in Story County. We had Brenda Brink in State House District 49, Jody Clemens in State House District 73, Tracy Freeze in State House District 2, and it goes on and on and on. More people like us are starting to come out and say, you know what, I'm the only one that can do this stuff because we're the ones that are fighting for it. We know the most, we're experts, we live it. We need to be running for office. Another thing that shows that we had a big impact on the elections is a lot of newspapers during the election cycle came out in favor of our work. So their editorial board, the Des Moines Register, headline, Hog Wild, Iowa must tap the brakes on record growth of hog industry. Waterloo Courier, Big Pork Needs Big Regulation, Storm Lake Times, How Much More Manure Can We Handle? 
Iowa City Press Citizen, Call for a Factory Farm Moratorium, Autumnal Courier, State Must Find Matrix Solution, Mason City Globe Gazette, Set the Stage for Legislative Work on CAFOs. That shows us that this work is extremely important. We have to keep doing it. We're not gonna get a moratorium this session. We know that, but this stuff is important. It's what gets us there. Um, another thing that I think it's important to talk about with the election is how are people talking about this? What was the narrative that we saw so that we can be better prepared for our talking points coming into the legislative session? Um, what we've been hearing out in rural Iowa a lot is that the livestock industry is just too important to our economy to pass a moratorium. And I think that everyone can say safely here that our water is too important to not pass a moratorium and that our air is too important to not pass a moratorium. And that the fact that we need to have farming in the next generation, that's too important to not pass a moratorium. We're not saying we're anti-agriculture. We're not anti-farmer. We're pro-agriculture that benefits our communities, that builds soil, that reverses climate change, and that feeds ourselves and our communities. Um, what, what we have right now in rural Iowa isn't working for us. It's not working for our communities. It's working for Farm Bureau and for Monsanto and for Iowa Select. And the farmers in Iowa that are engaged in this system, you know, they're, they're trapped in this system. And as we transition into a system that works for everyone, there's a place for them in that system. So we're not saying that we are gonna just wipe out farming. What we're saying is that we need to re-envision farming. Um, so livestock industry is too important for our economy to pass the moratorium, false. Um, that we need more water quality funding for the nutrient reduction strategy. We're gonna hear a lot about funding for water quality. Um, what we need to focus on though, is that the public shouldn't be paying to clean up corporate ag factory farm messes. And that if we are going to use any taxpayer money, it has to be for mandatory solutions. We cannot use uh, public money for a voluntary program. It's simply not a good use of our taxpayer dollars. Um, another narrative that we hear out there is that if we try to do local control, it's just going to be 99 sets of different rules. That's simply not true. That's what the industry wants us to think. Um, local control means that we have the exact same permitting system that we have now, except for what the county says is the final answer. It's no longer a county recommendation, it's a county final say. And that means that it's still, we could still potentially have the master matrix, we still have the DNR implementing and enforcing all the regulations, the state house still passing the laws, it's the same laws across the state, but the county can say no. That's basically what we want with local control. And then the other thing that I think we're going to see a lot of, especially with Republican controlled state house, is that um, in order to try to like, you know, bring down some of our complaints that have um, been really reaching a tipping point lately is they're going to start talking about how we should use this manure for an alternative energy source or how we have electrostatic fences to drop the smell down for nearby neighbors. This new superior technology is not a solution. That does not put an end to the fact that we have corporate controlled ag system. That doesn't always protect our water. That doesn't solve all the problems associated with factory farms. And what it really does is if, if um, we're gonna start supporting superior technologies, our taxpayer dollars are gonna be funding that. And it's just another prop that allows factory farms to build in our state. Um, so those are some of the narratives that we're gonna have to battle. We need to stand strong and just keep saying, no, it's a moratorium. A moratorium solves all our problems. Um, so what does all this mean, this kind of quick post-election analysis, is that one, our moratorium campaign is really, really strong and it's making a huge impact and that's because all of you out there are working your butts off, getting moratorium petition signatures, passing county resolutions, we're up to 23 resolutions across the state, would love to get to 30 by the legislative session. Um, we're also, realistically, we're not going to see any good bills this session. That's not what the session is going to be about. It's going to be about us building our power um, so that way we come into the 2020 legislative session with more force. Um, we're going to have to monitor and stop bad bills. We have to be prepared for that. We're going to, and that usually is going to happen last minute. So it's going to be important to monitor action alerts. Um, whenever the um, Ag Committee tries to pass a bill, we usually don't find out about it until 24 hours in advance. Um, and so that means that in the meantime, between uh, waiting to see what they're going to do up at the Capitol. We need to be doing work in our home districts 
passing more resolutions, attending legislative forums, writing letters, talking to our neighbors and building a bigger base of people who support a moratorium. That way in the long run, we can win more elections, we can get more legislators to sign on and we can pressure more factory farm legislators to get with us or get out. So that's just my quick um, post-election analysis. I I'm sure it's gonna uh, change as we get closer to the session once we see who they're gonna appoint to be um, the House Minority Leader, who's gonna be the ranking members on the House Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee, um, how many legislators are gonna co-sponsor our bill. That's gonna be all to come. We'll keep you updated as we hear more about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. All right, so very quickly, um, we'll talk about lessons that we learned from last year and then we'll move on to how you can get involved and take a few questions. Um, so we ran a moratorium bill in both the House and the Senate last year. Um, the moratorium bill in the Senate was introduced along with a slate of other bills, I think 14 or 15, um, that Senator David Johnson introduced. All of those bills suggested critically important updates and improvements to Iowa's regulations that govern this industry. Um, but unfortunately, because there were so many of them, it was difficult to kind of focus on any one, and it was very difficult for us to track them. Um, and it was tough from a, from a narrative position to kind of talk about the moratorium while also talking about the slate of improvements that we were advocating for. So what we've learned is that um, with a Republican trifecta, a Republican governor in both houses of the legislature being Republican controlled, that it really makes sense to focus on one bill instead of multiple bills and to use that one bill, the moratorium bill in this case, as a vehicle to build power and to move legislators more toward our side. Um, so this year we'll be focusing on the moratorium bill alone and we're really excited about the opportunities that that presents. We've also learned that we're gonna have a better, a better chance in the House than we'll have in the Senate. Um, last year we had a prime sponsor of the House bill, Sharon Steckman, and we had nine additional co-sponsors and we're hoping to grow that number this year. We are hoping to be able to get a committee hearing on that bill in the House this year. Um, and we'll be, once the bill is assigned to committee and then to subcommittee, we'll be bringing pressure to those subcommittee members to hear the bill. We've also learned that it's more effective with the Republican trifecta to bring pressure in, in senators and representatives' home districts along with in the Capitol. We need to work in the Capitol, but if you can meet your legislators in a legislative forum or in a coffee shop or in their home office, it really sends a message to them that their constituents care deeply about this issue. We've also learned that we need to use those county resolutions that Jess spoke of, 23 resolutions in total, um, resolutions either in favor of a moratorium or stronger local control. We need to use those as a tool to pressure our legislators. Those resolutions were passed because constituents in those counties demanded that they, they be passed. And so if there is a legislator who represents people in a county that have already passed a county resolution, that legislator needs to get on board because those county residents have already demanded action at the county level and we're going to be making sure their voices are heard in Des Moines as well. And then again, as Jess mentioned, we learned that the question and answer um, surveys that local papers sent out to candidates have really shown candidates and our elected officials that they need to respond to this issue. They can't ignore this issue any longer. It's, it's reached the level in the press and in people's lives that it, it's critically important and they're learning now that, you know, we, their constituents will be asking them questions, their newspapers will be asking them questions and that they have to have an answer to be able to respond to this issue. So we hope that you are energized and excited to get involved in this effort because as we've said, we can't do this without you. We're gonna hear now from Emma Schmidt, who's Food and Water Watch's Iowa organizer about the specific ways that you can get involved. Emma helps to build our organizing effort to stop the negative impacts of factory farms on Iowa's communities and the environment. And she works to activate our members to join the state campaign to win a legislative moratorium on new and expanded factory farms. Emma? All right, thank you, Chrissy. Um, you did forget one thing in your introduction, and that is that we saved the best for last. So, we've talked about our past efforts to rein in the factory farm industry. We've discussed what we learned uh, last year at the, in the legislative session, and what our strategy will be like going into this year's legislative session. 
Now we get to talk about what you can do to help us win a moratorium on new and expanded factory farms in Iowa. So I made this beautiful little PowerPoint to save you all from staring at my face for the next five minutes. Um, our first thing we're gonna talk about is that if you haven't signed our moratorium petition, please do. We want 10,000 signatures by January 1st to present our legislators. Um, we're almost halfway to our goal. So if you've already signed, get your neighbors to sign, your family, your mailman, your waitress, everyone you possibly can think of to sign to. Uh, if you don't already have the link to the petition, we will send out an email tomorrow. Um, another thing is if you are a member of both CCI and Food and Water Watch, it's a time for that too. Um, we are offering a bargain right now. You can get uh, both organizations, you can join both organizations for $50. So I don't know about you, but that is a bargain to me. Um, you can get all of your holiday shopping done in one step. You can be the Oprah Winfrey of your family. You get a membership, you get a membership. Yes, little Sophie, even you get a membership. We're ready to put Santa Claus out of business here. So. Uh, we're also asking folks to attend any legislative forums that come up in your area. Um, we'll be rolling out a toolkit here really soon to help you find details about upcoming forums. Um, and as long as we're talking about the holidays, forget about losing those 10 pounds for your New Year's resolution. Make your New Year's resolution a plan to attend a legislative forum and ask your legislators about supporting a moratorium on factory farms. Those 10 pounds can wait. Our air, our water, and our quality of life can't. So finally, uh, mark your calendars for our moratorium day on February 21st. We're gonna be having a lobby day at the state capitol and you will not want to miss it, I promise. Um, if you're too comfortable right now to get up and mark your calendar this very second, don't worry. Uh, we're gonna be reminding you relentlessly until February 21st. So um, if you have any questions, about anything we've talked about tonight or you want to learn more opportunities to get involved just shoot emma that's me or jess an email and uh we'll get back to you so you can reach me at eschmidt at fwwatch.org that is e-s-c-h-m-i-t at f-w-w-a-t-c-h dot o-r-g or jess at jess at i-o-c-c-i dot org that's j-e-s-s -S at i-o-w-a dot o-r-g Thank you guys so much. I'll pass it back to you guys for Q&A. Thanks, Emma. Um, so if you didn't catch those action steps, don't worry. I can sense that you're frantically writing. We'll be sending you an email, as Emma said, within the next couple days with links to ways you can get involved, as well as a recording of this webinar in case you'd like to watch it again. So at this point, we have just a couple minutes for some questions. We have a few that were already submitted, but if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The first is, what questions should we ask our legislators in the upcoming session? Emma, would you like to handle that? Sure, why not? So we have two main questions we want to get out of our legislators. The first one is obviously, do you support a moratorium? And if they say no, we want to follow up and ask why they won't support a moratorium. The second question we want to figure out is if our legislators support mandatory or voluntary compliance for factory farms. So those are two really simple things to remember. Thanks, Emma. All right, we have another question. This one, I think for Jess, do we expect any bad bills during the legislative session? That is a good question because I think that we should be prepared for some bad bills this session. Um, luckily, I have a list prepared because <laughs> we've been thinking about this already. Um, so one of the questions that the Farm Bureau asked all of the Secretary of Ag candidates this year was, do you support a change to the I will formula? That's the Iowa Water um, Land and Legacy Fund. It's the, the 3 8 cents sales tax. You may have heard it called that. Um, but what we've been saying all along is that factory farms see I will as their piggy bank and they really do. They want to change the formula and they want to make it be um, able to be just handed out to corporate ag. Um, so we need to watch out for a formula change for I will. Um, we've seen other states battle right to farm bills. I think that we um, should be prepared to fight a right to farm bill, which basically would make um, allow you to do anything you want on your own property or with immunity. Um, which I agree with, but you should not also be able to harm other people. 
So it's not that we don't want people to have, you know, freedoms, but we don't want them to pollute our water and our air and right to farm will allow them to do that with immunity. Um, we could also see a bill to dismantle the Des Moines Water Works again. Uh, we stopped that bill in the past, but we know that um, that is a retaliatory bill. And so the more that we continue to build this campaign that we're gonna see a lot of retaliation. So we should be expected to um, see that they try to dismantle the Des Moines Water Works again. Um, another thing that we know that Governor Kim Reynolds uh, is really interested in is water quality funding, but she wants to take it from education. Um, we believe that we should tax the corporate profits from corporate agribusiness. They're a $112 billion industry. They got the money. We don't need to be taking it from our already starved education system here in Iowa. Thanks, Jess. We have one final question, and that is, what is the likelihood of passing a bill this year? That is an excellent question. So just to be a realist, um, it is doubtful that we will pass a moratorium on new and expanded factory farms this year. Um, we really see this year as an opportunity to build power, to organize people, to pressure legislators, to make this an even bigger issue in the media and as an opportunity to use the county resolution campaigns to pressure legislators to act on this issue. So our, our hope, as I said before, is to get a committee hearing this year. We are very hopeful we'll be able to do that. We're hopeful that we'll take it a bit further the following year, but this is a long-term campaign and we intend to continue to work on it until we win. Um, but every little bit, every step, every letter that's written, every op-ed that's published, every county resolution that's passed, every legislator that we're able to sway, or if we can't sway, every legislator that we're able to replace with somebody who's a champion on this issue, just builds the campaign toward the point where eventually we're gonna pass this legislation and we will win a moratorium on new and expanded factory farms in Iowa. It's gonna take all of you being really involved and making it happen and we're grateful you've been by our side this long and we hope you'll continue to work with us over the next couple of years until we make this a reality. Looks like those are all of the questions. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up our webinar this evening. Thanks again for joining us and for your questions. We hope this leaves you feeling energized and excited to get involved in the campaign. Look for an email from us in the next few days with resources, next steps, and links. On behalf of Food and Water Watch and Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, thanks so much for joining us and have a great night. Thank you.